welcome to the order and stand for the call of worship. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up. Yea, everlasting door and the King of glory shall come in. But you are the chosen people. You are the king's priest. You are a holy national. You are a national that belongs to God alone. God chose you to tell about the wonderful things that have that He have done. He called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. I will be I will be reciting the Lord's prayer, and I will ask could you recite it with, with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This will be our death. And forgive our death, Lord. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us for evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I believe we're ready for worship. And I'm going to ask you if you would join in with me in singing one of our favorite hymns. So I ask that at this time, if you would just stand to your feet and help me to sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Anybody in here love Jesus besides me?
Hallelujah. Amen. have your attention for the announcement. We welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service. Each Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m. Sunday school and 10.30 a.m. worship service is in person and morning worship is live streamed via Facebook at NBC7 1922. Today's worship service can be viewed at 5 o'clock p.m. via Facebook on Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church or NBC7 1922 and YouTube, Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church Film, and also aired on WHBB 1490 AM radio station. At this time, we ask those worshiping in person to go ahead and prepare your offering to be placed in the offering receptacles during the offering tour period. Offerings may be given online by going to the church website at mbc7.org, click on Give a Fly, and follow the prompts, and mail to Ebenezer P.O. Box 2425 Film. 36702 or you may call the church at 334-875-1382 to arrange pickup. For transportation to Sunday morning worship, please call the church, leave your name, address, and phone number so they be put on the list for pickup. We invite you to join our Wednesday evening 5 o'clock p.m. Bible study by logging into Zoom. The login info is on the monitor. Please call the church or minister Carolyn Robinson for additional assistance. Happy birthday to all October birthday celebrants. NBC, Selma, Youth and Family, Embrace My Belief in Christ, Youth Night Ignite is held here at the church every Thursday from 3.30 p.m. to 6 o'clock p.m. Please call the church for additional information. Sprinkle Me Pink, Breast Cancer Awareness, Color, Run, Walk, or Stroll. Please wear a white t-shirt for fun and walking shoes or come as you are. Hosted by elect lady Cynthia Perkins and Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church and Shady Grove District Association to support breast cancer survivors, patients, and remember those who have gained their wings. All participants are asked to please RSVP on or before October 26th. This event will be held next Sunday, October 29th from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. at Block Park, set up at 2 o'clock p.m. Our churches, organizations, and friends are welcome to join us. For additional information, call 334-327-9665 or ep2excel at gmail.com. New Cedar Grove Missionary Baptist Church, 24 Eugene Avenue, is celebrating the 53rd pastoral anniversary under Pastor Dan M. Moore at 2 o'clock noon today. Guest Pastor Leo King, Little Girl Baptist Church, Marion, Alabama. First Pastoral Anniversary Appreciation Honor of Reverend LeBaron Matt, Pastor of Little Rock Missionary Baptist Church, 2980 Earl Goodwin Parkway, Selma, will be held today at 1 o'clock p.m. Guest Minister, Reverend Frederick Hardy, Pastor of the Freedom Missionary Baptist Church, Selma and Pulpit Conductor, Assistant Pastor, Reverend Marvin M. Thomas Sr., we pray continually for our bereaved families, our sick and shut-in, caregivers, this community, and for one another. All announcements requested to be included in the Sunday live stream must be emailed to mbc 1922 at gmail.com no later than Thursday at 2 o'clock noon each week. Any announcements sent after that, time, after that time will be included in the following Sunday. This ends the announcement. Good morning, one more time. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord again and want to just encourage us to keep all of these announcements that we've heard uh, in mind and govern ourselves accordingly. I want to continue in prayer for those bereaved families that uh, are sharing, uh, we share in their grief and the loss of their loved ones. 
Uh, this is our Youth Sunday. Let's give our youth a hand. Praise for their participation and service today. We just thank God for them. Um, Y'all, that big smile I hadn't seen Lady Leg Perkins in a couple of days, so that's just a smile. I, hey, baby. All right. It's good to see you. I'm glad to make, know that you all made it safe and sound. They've been at a women's conference the past uh, couple of days, and uh, uh, just glad to see you. I think Sister, Sister Wanda Jones traveled with you, did she not? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Sister Jones, how you doing? Yeah, Ebenezer was represented at a women's conference, and I look forward to getting a full report. Uh, on that. Um, the uh, officers uh, for all of the auxiliaries uh, must be uh, elected this month, uh, before the end of this month. So if your auxiliary has not met and elect officers, I am putting everyone on notice that I probably will be uh, um, setting down your auxiliary and re-engaging it. Did everybody get that? And there are some auxiliaries I'm going to sit down anyway because you ain't doing nothing. And so, amen. And so we're going to do, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to uh, press the reset button on uh, some of the things that are happening and are not happening. Uh, and we want to make sure that everyone understands that past ain't being mean. We just, we just uh, resetting the engine. Uh, there are some things that need to change. And uh, it is, I believe my responsibility as pastor to lead those changes. So we're going to be working on that. I want to keep all these announcements. And now we actually, the officers now will come forward and prepare uh, and to receive uh, the offerings uh, for today. Our annual conference will be the last Thursday in November. The annual conference will be the last Thursday in November. And we need to make certain that all of the officers and all of the organizing work for all of the auxiliaries completed this month so that uh, we can have the calendar prepared and get that ready uh, for, um, uh, for uh, the next fiscal year. Ms. Robinson, what you doing? Um, Pastor, uh, don't punish me, punish Deacon Johnson. He asked me to come down here and do this. While I'm interfering for him, he needs to come on in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, doing this, but I don't want punishment for it. Uh, Deacons, if y'all just take a seat for just a moment. The Word of God tells us that beautiful are the feet of them that brings us good tidings or preaches the Word of God, the good news, and I think he announced last Sunday that we were going to do this. Pastor, please don't, don't stop. Okay. okay, thank you, sir. So they're coming on in now. And there's going to be a nice surprise for you and uh, everybody. So we want you all to go ahead and prepare your gifts. And when you bring your offering, you'll be able to uh, get that done, too. Don't take from the offering now. It's supposed to be extra. All right? So I think Sister Alton has something in her hands. And Mr. Johnson, I'm holding these cards. And he has not come in this door yet. <laughs> Just embarrassing. But anyway, Pastor, we just wanted to let you know how much we love you and appreciate you and all that you do. We don't do it often enough, Sister Perkins. And if you just come on down here with me, please. Yes, ma'am. Come on. I know you've been traveling. You've been gone all weekend. And I, we're not going to look at how you dress. You always look beautiful. Doesn't she look beautiful, y'all? She doesn't have to do a whole lot of hoop to do and all of that. She's just naturally beautiful. Pastor did a good job when he chose her. Pastor, will you come on over in the middle here, both of you, please, so we can move quickly and get this over with. Amen. Deacon Johnson, you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you, sir. Believe it or not, spontaneity is sometimes good. And so, Pastor, we have a surprise for you and First Lady and also for your staff. Okay. Bring it on. And I hope somebody snapped the picture.
try to get the picture. And uh, Miss Cynthia. <coughs> Sister Cynthia, the legs are actually tied, and uh, so you don't have to worry. Uh, he is not going to. It's a he, you all. Do you recognize what it is? It's a rooster. And he was brought to us last night. And do you know it brought back memories when I walked outside and I heard, Dr. Doodle! Uh, Sister Cynthia, can you can you uh, also get close enough? Uh, the chicken is not. She has the chicken and it's not gonna harm you. Okay, that's close enough. Okay, all right, Sister Johnson, you can take the chicken back. Now, Pastor. Sister Cynthia, uh, it was suggested that we go to Sam's and get one of the uh, rotisserie chicken, but that would not have had the effect. Do you, all, uh, do you agree? All right, amen. Uh, now, Pastor, would you, uh, uh, we have cards here, and also uh, we can use these same baskets, uh, and we'll take up this. How many of you remember, I asked that Pastor had done something bring some type of offering. So we'll do that very quickly uh, now, if you would. But I'd like for the associate minister to come forward and the assistant pastor at this time. You all come to be uh, recognized. And pastor, if we can take this offering, uh, and there are some other gifts, I think, for you. Uh, and I want to be sure that we do this. Thank you. Uh, this is pastor. Dr. L.L. L. Russell is, is not here. Uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Felicia King Thomas. And I did not get a chance to uh, receive all these. Okay, we did receive the same letter. Okay. Uh, Minister Carolyn Robinson. Uh, Reverend Marvin Thomas. And I will hold on to this for Pastor uh, Reverend Dr. L.L. Uh, Russell. So as we come with our offering, uh, and, and here are some other gifts. Okay. This is from the church. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Now, uh, once we, once I finish this, I just want to make one statement. To whom much is given, much is required. And I think Pastor has given from his heart over the years. And I just thank each of you for what you've done. At this time, uh, would someone make sure that we get a picture of this uh, presentation? Okay. Okay, now the gold, uh, the gold basket will be, uh, the gold tray will be for the pastor's gift. And please feel free at the time we have the offering, we will just come down to that for the offering. So thank you all, and pastor, you can talk to me later. I did that. I shouldn't have told him that last week. <laughs> I should have known, Miss Johnson. <laughs> I think it brought back a lot of memories, It did. It did. <laughs> oh Lord. Let's um let's see if we can get back. <laughs> yeah, back to the spirit of, of worship. 
Let us stand. <laughs> Father, we just acknowledge you. We acknowledge your presence, your power, your grace, and your mercy. Father, we thank you for everything you've done for us, through us, and to us. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for your word. We thank you. Now, Father, as we prepare to honor you and your blessings toward us by giving a portion of that which you have given to us, we thank you for the ability to give. We ask in the name of Jesus that hearts of those who are giving will be pure. And we pray in the name of Jesus that the gifts given will be multiplied and used for the uplift and building of your kingdom. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, incline you to us and grant us your peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Beginning at the rear of the church, following the direction of the ushers, bring your tithes and offerings at this time. Please don't let me let them be the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them the sins of pride. Make it easier. Thank you. And the children's lives. The mind is high. Everybody searching for a hero. People need someone to look up to. Never found anyone who fulfilled me. That's good. A lonely place to be. So I learned to depend on me. I decided my If I succeed, 
Thank you. You've got a hand raised. Got a hand raised again. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. It's about giving these babies a chance, Amen. giving them an opportunity to serve in their own way. Thank you. Thank you, Zanar. Thank you. We give God praise and glory. Ms. Johnson, I'm going to get you back. I don't know how. <laughs> but I'm going to get you back. <laughs> I don't have time to tell my chicken story, but <clears throat> we'll do that one day. This past week, there were two funerals that required my attention. And in addition to that, even as early as this morning, I've been notified about several deaths that chill my spirit. But I'm not going to linger on those recent deaths. But I point out that we laid to rest Reverend Dr. Joe James Peterson, former pastor of the Bethel Missionary Baptist Church and former moderator of our own Shady Grove District Association. So we continue in prayer for the Peterson family. Another funeral that was impactful to me uh, this week was that of Alvin Ben. I was not able to attend Al's funeral, but our son, Justin, was a close friend of Eric Ben. Al's son. And so Justin was able to represent me at Al's homegoing service. Uh, however, I did attend Al's burial service. I, I mentioned this for two reasons. First, I mentioned it because Al was an investigative news reporter who wrote for the Selma Times Journal and the Montgomery Advertiser. Al used a lot of ink uh, writing about Selma's political landscape. And his writings influenced many community and political decisions in and around Selma. Initially, Al's writings uh, were less than flattering about me. I was perceived as a threat to the political establishment. I was that person that threatened status quo. I needed to be stopped, but over time, Al's writing became a little softer towards me. He softened his writing. It seemed as though his opinion about me and my stand on the issues were no longer a threat, but because, uh, but because of something that happened, it seemed to have become somewhat of a breath of fresh air. I'm telling you this for a reason. Someone who was once considered an adversary that I dreaded seeing and hearing from had actually become a friend whom I look forward to greeting and chatting with. And then our sons, Al's son and my son, became friends. Slept in each other's homes, mentored each other's children. It's just amazing how God can take disagreement and produce love. 
But th th there is something else about the Ben Perkins relationship. I'm going somewhere with this. Y'all know me. I'm going somewhere with this. I want you to, to just hear me out. Because there's something else about this Ben Perkins relationship, you see it. See, Al was Jewish. And his family is Jewish. And Al's homegoing uh, services were performed by a Jewish rabbi. And it was complete with Jewish uh, religious rituals and traditions. And as I reflected on my relationship with Al and his son and the Ben family, I thought about the current war in Israel and Gaza between the Israelites and Hamas. Uh, we, you know, we have, a, we have a pretty good idea. We have a, a general idea about who the Israelites are because they are very prominent in our Bible. We know very little about Hamas. But, uh, but uh, according to Wikipedia, Hamas is, is uh, a Sunni Islamic political and military organization that governs the Palestinian territory in Gaza. And when, when, I, when I spoke with the Ben's family, I found out something. I found out that a close and immediate family member and his wife lives in Israel. And the wife is in the Israeli military. And not only that, the wife is deployed in the war zone. You see, it was at that moment that, that when I was spending time with my Jewish friends uh, with Selma ties, that I realized that, 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 that now I have someone close to me in Israel directly involved in the conflict. See, see if you, y'all don't mind, just, just let me, let me uh, exhale here a moment. See, if you Google, if you Google search uh, the Palestinian people, what you will find is based on their historical references. They believe that they are the descendants of the Canaanites. And so if the Palestinians are descendants of the Canaanites, then as Christians, not only should my relationship with the Ben family be relevant to me, but also, I really need to understand how we, I'm talking about the people, are attached to this conflict. See, as Christians, our faith is actually birthed out of Judaism. We are, technically speaking, Judeo-Christians. And if the Bible is holy to us, then we would do well to study what the Bible says about this matter. See, I believe that everything in the Bible is true. Therefore, what MSNBC and CNN and ABC and CBS, what they have to say about this war, it does not mean nearly as much to me as what the Bible has to say. See, I, 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 I have settled in my own mind. I, everybody got their opinion about this, but I've settled in my own mind that the battle in Gaza today is not about that land, but it is about the brutality of war without rules. Uh, it is about the indiscriminate killing of babies, innocent babies and innocent children, innocent women and men. Today, that is the issue. That's what we're dealing with today. There is nothing that can be justified with what Hamas did. And Israel's response is not an intentional retaliation by killing the innocent. But I see it as an effort to destroy the possibility of this happening again to any people.
the war conditions that we see in this world today, I want you to understand that I think that we are as close to a world war as we have been since the Bay of Pigs. I don't have time to do the history lesson on that. But I'm saying, Ebenezer, do not misunderstand, do not underestimate the importance of what's taking place now. And so all of this, all of this took me back. It took me, uh, it, it, it took me to a place in the Old Testament that can help us better understand what I have chosen for the subject of this message. And the subject that I've chosen for today is the fundamental foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith. The fundamental foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith. And I've chosen as a text, I went to the Psalms of David and I selected Psalm 19, verse or stanza 14, where it says something that's very familiar to us. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Now, you all know that this text is how I usually start my sermons. It is a simple prayer. That's all it is. It is a simple prayer that was prayed by David after he deeply reflected on, and he was deeply reflecting on the presence of, and the power of God, the presence, the strength, and the power of the word of God. He, 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 considering the current events that I previously mentioned as your shepherd, as the one who has the responsibility to educate us on theological issues, I feel it necessary uh, to teach about the relationship between Israel and those of us who are sitting in Christian churches today. We are much closer uh, to each other than you probably have given any thought to. But we need only go to the first five books in the Bible to better understand this relationship. I want to share some terms with you. Hebrew, Jew, Israelite. Generally, these terms refer to the same people. Moses, when he was referred, he was referred to as Hebrew. Jesus was Jewish. Both were from the lineage of Abraham. Pray with me. Both traced back to Adam. Please don't miss this. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who was renamed Israel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Ezekiel, Bel to Cesar, who was renamed Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, they were ne renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hosea, Amos. All of these prophets were Jewish. The laws and the prophets of the Old Testament are the birth of Judaism. I'm trying to help somebody. In, in fact, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, these five books 
We sometimes refer to them as the books of Moses. These are the Torah. Somebody say Torah. These are the Torah. These, these are commonly referred to as the Torah. The Torah is the scriptural foundation for our Christian faith. Upon which all of the other sections of the Bible, they reside on the Torah, the law, the history, the poetry, the prophets, the gospel, the letters, the epistle, the writings, all find their foundation in the Torah. Thank you for saying amen, baby. The Torah is the foundation, I'm trying to help somebody, of our Judeo-Christian faith. And the first five books of our Bible is the fundamental foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith. Thus, to better understand Christianity, thus to better understand who we say we are, we really need to understand the fundamental foundation, in other words, the basics about what we believe. And in order to get that understanding, we need to start with Genesis. Genesis, meaning beginning. I, I, let me say that again. Genesis means beginning. Events Involving Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Eve, Jacob, are recorded in Genesis. Genesis gives us the creation story and the foundation for the formation of the Sabbath. Our Sunday, the day of rest, the foundation of it comes from Genesis. The foundation, the meaning and history of human life is Genesis. Genesis explains and Genesis justifies the existence of our all-wise and all-knowing and all-powerful God. Genesis is the first mentioning of our triune God. Oh, where does that happen, Pastor Perk? Uh, let us. Make man. Genesis is the very foundation and fundamentals of our faith. The origin and explanation of human evil is in Genesis. The, the, the benefits from separating oneself from evil, that's Genesis. Genesis is, it's the beginning. It is the beginning of who we are. It is the beginning of whose we are. It is the beginning of what we believe. Second, Exodus. Exodus tells us. It tells how God delivers his people from evils of mistreatment and oppression. The historic events surrounding the Israelites being released from Egyptian slavery is used but for an illustration of divine deliverance. Exodus shows us how to get over when you're getting put down. Exodus says that God used Moses to prove to us that he knows us and that he assigns us even before we were born. God knew that Moses was going to end up in that basket. God knew that Moses was the, was, was the instrument of the exodus. Anybody ever, help me Holy Ghost, anybody uh, knows that life can actually become a desert to you. It can become like a desert. You can be hopeless in your own desert. You can be without water. You can be with no food. You can be with no shelter when you're Life becomes like a desert. You, you have nothing but the clothes on your backs. Exodus is, 
is how you live when you're in your desert. Exodus shows us how not to live when you're in your desert. Exodus shows how, how, how not following a righteous God, not following godly leadership will leave you in the desert for 40 years longer than you ought to be there. Exodus shows us how following godly leadership can lead you to your promised land if you just lean and depend on it. Exodus gives divine direction for a life of worship. Exodus shows how to go from an unorganized and broken life of slavery to a nation ruled by God. That's what Exodus is. In the Torah, Genesis shows us our beginning. And Exodus shows us how to move. And then third, Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus means things pertaining to God. Uh, named after Levi, the third son of Jacob. Leviticus is the, 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 the section and the assignments of, it is the, the section, it is the section that shows the selection and the assignment of church leadership. Leviticus shows the formation of religious law. Leviticus is the birth of our faith leader. Leviticus is the organization of God's law. Y'all don't mind if I teach, do you? Leviticus is the expansion and expectation of what God meant when he spoke the Ten Commandments. Somebody say Decalogue. That means ten. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, Leviticus, is the legal layout. Leviticus is the comprehensive code of conduct. Leviticus is governing the relationship between God and man. Leviticus is governing the relationship among men, those relationships between us and each other. Leviticus is the foundation for the general rules of law. I want you to know something. Know that Leviticus is not specifically followed by Christians, uh, but what we do is we recognize Leviticus as being correct for that time. And we recognize that the same God that gave them, Levitic, gave them Leviticus gave us Jesus. You see, the Torah, Genesis shows us the beginning. Exodus shows us how to move. And Leviticus shows us how to relate to God and how to relate to each other. And then fourth, there is numbers. Numbers is the counting. Somebody say census. Numbers is the counting of the Israelites. Numbers is the traveling log. Numbers is the pre-Jesus GPS. Numbers is the tracking of the journey. Numbers is the counting of uh, the cost of humanity being disobedient to God. Number is measuring the time of trouble. How, just how difficult it is to hold on to one's faith when you, help me Holy Ghost, when you uh, find yourself in trouble. Numbers is tracking trouble and disappointment causing humanity to break its relationship with the covenant. Numbers is showing God over and over and over again, showing his faithfulness. It's showing that he can count infinitely many times and show his faithfulness in keeping his promises. The Torah, ah, let me repeat myself. Genesis shows us our beginning. Exodus shows us how to move. Leviticus shows us how to relate to God and to each other. Numbers is God's data-driven methodology. In other words, God's saying, I can show you better than I can tell you. Yes, and then fifth, that is Deuteronomy, which really means the second law. Deuteronomy 
Somebody say second time around. Uh, Deuteronomy is God's persistence. Deuteronomy shows his patience. Deuteronomy is God's willingness to wait for stubborn to die. Deuteronomy is God's another chance. Deuteronomy is that we need to remember when you go wrong and don't do it again. See, the Torah, the Torah, Genesis shows us our beginning. Exodus shows us how to, how to move. Leviticus shows us how to relate to God and to each other. Numbers is God's data-driven show and tell. Deuteronomy is the persistence and patience of God showing uh, that regardless of what we do, he is a promise keeper. Uh, that he is yet God of another chance. These five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, these five books in our Bible, that was David's complete Bible. I want you to see this. That's all David had. That was David's complete Bible, the Torah. When David wrote the Psalms, when David wrote the Psalms, all he had was the scrolls. The Torah was his Bible. So David refers to the Torah by many names. He wasn't talking about what was done after him, but he referred to the Torah as the law. He referred to it as the testimony. He referred to it as the statute. He referred to it as the commandments. He even referred to it as fear and judgment. All refer to David's Bible. The first five books, David describes his Bible with all of these terms. Let me help you with this. In Psalm 19, in this text, the pretext of it, David declares, he says that, uh, he says the, uh, that the law is perfect. In other words, that it, the law restores and refreshes the soul. And then David declares that when the the Torah, when we consume it, when we take it on the inside, that the Torah makes the soul complete. That means that there is no partiality in the Torah. There is no big I's and little U's in the Torah. David says the Torah is perfect. He says there is no bias in the Torah. There is no discriminatory practices in the Torah. There is no superior or inferior people in the Torah. That in the Torah, there is only a help me, Holy Ghost. There is only a superior God in the Torah. All right. D David says he, he says that it is so perfect. It, 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 it is so perfect that it is so simple. It is simple enough for everybody to understand it. Regardless of your education, regardless of your age, regardless of your gender, regardless of your class or your culture, David says it's easy to understand it. He says it's so perfect that when, 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 when internalized, it, it converts the soul of man. He says it's so perfect that when, when properly used, it corrects the direction in life. He declares that when we internalize the Torah, that it shifts our intention. The wrong that we intend to do will shift to the right that we had no intentions of doing. He says regardless of your IQ, you become among the wisest in humanity. If you simply put your trust in the word of God. David declares that the testimony of the Lord is sure. He says it is reliable and it is trustworthy. Even children are wise to rely upon the evidence that God is real. He says for his testimony is the evidence 
His testimony is the proof that he has never lost a battle. His testimony is the proof that he knows how to make a way out of no way. That his testimony is sure that there is one on time God. That he is on time and he is a provider. That's the testimony. Then David declares that the statute of the Lord are right. In other words, you can't go wrong following the laws of God. There is no wrong in God's rights. Uh, that, that, that there is no wrong in his right. He, he shows right. He, he leads right. He directs right. He rules right. Because God is right. And then David declares that, that the commandments of the Lord is pure. He said there is no blemish in his commandments. Uh, there, is no, there is no spot in his commandments. There is no wrinkle in his commandments. And then to complete the matter, I, I need to shift just a moment. I, I need to shift because David, David did something interesting right here. He did a shift, so let me shift with it. And let me help you with something. See, the book of Job. Somebody say Job. Job. Somebody say not Job. Not Job. Job. The book of Job is considered the oldest written book in the Bible. It's not the first in the Bible, but considered to be the oldest book in the Bible. In it, Job considers matters of wisdom. And he concluded about wisdom. This is what he says. Job says, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. And, and, and on that same matter, that, that, that fellow that we say is the wisest of all wise, Solomon chimes in, and he reports in Proverbs 1, 7, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But then David got in the act, and he declares that the fear of the Lord makes the believer clean, purifies the believer, endures, and it endures forever, Help me, Holy Ghost, and ever and ever. And then to conclude the matter, David then declares that not only is God perfect, not only is he sure, not only is his word right and it is pure, but his judgment is altogether righteous and true. See, without his word, without the word of God, we cannot understand when we go wrong. It is the word of God that helps us to see when we are out of step with God. It is the word of God that will reveal to us our own secret faults. If humanity was to keep God's word, if we just kept his word, we will remain safe. For his word will warn us. And when we heed the warning, help me Holy Ghost, he will protect us. His word, His word keeps even the thought of sinning away from us. His word will not allow sin to rule over us. His word keeps our living upright. Even when the adversary declares us guilty, God's word keeps us innocent. Well, Pastor Perk, that's some heavy stuff. That's some good teaching. But what can I do? Oh, help me, Holy Ghost, with this information. What is my takeaway today? Well, can I just remind us that we live awfully fast, that our lives are fast on steroids. And as we run through life, most of us never really think about the condition of our soul. We pay attention to how our body feels. We speak of our aches and pains. 
We pay attention to what our minds think. We recognize when we're depressed and suffering from anxiety. But we rarely give notice to the condition of our soul. In Psalm 19, what David does in this psalm, he reminds us that we need to take time, help me Holy Ghost, to reflect on the condition of our soul. And when we do, David is saying to us, he is telling us that we will see what is actually missing in our life. See, I am convinced that David is telling us when our lives get turned upside down, that thing that is missing is the word of God. David has convinced me that the word of God is so complete that it should be our primary desire of all of humanity. Yes, sir. David has convinced me that if we delight ourselves in the word of God, he shall, it didn't say that he might, but he shall give you the desires of your heart. David ends up his song uh, with a declaration of the power of the presence and the purpose of God's word. Uh, but he didn't do it this time with praise ye the Lord. He didn't do it with praise. He didn't do it this time with a declaration of worship. But this time David ends his declaration with a prayer. David prays, now, now Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. David declares that without God's, without God's acceptance of what comes from his mouth, that his words are meaningless. David declares that without God's acceptance of what meditation comes from his heart, that his heart desires are worthless. Therefore, David prays, help me, Holy Ghost, that God accept the words of his mouth and that God accept the thoughts that flows from his heart. And each time I stand before you, Ebenezer, each time I stand before you, each time I stand before you and to teach and to preach the word of God, I declare, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to God in my sight because you see I am convinced that the Lord is my strength I am convinced that when I run out of strength that it is the Lord that will redeem me it is God that will recharge me with his word I am encouraged today. Can I encourage you to accept the word of God as spirit? Accept the word of God as truth and true. Accept the word of God as a lamp unto your feet, as a light unto your pathway. Accept the word of God as powerful accept the word of God as eternal accept the word of God as a sharp as a sharp sword that cuts when it goes when it comes well Pastor Perk well how do you know that the word of God is spirit well, I know, I don't know about you, but I know that it's a spirit because I can feel, I feel it deep down in my soul.
so when it moves that's a burning there's a friction that it causes it just burns that wheel starts turning I can just feel it it makes you want to wave your hands if you got it it makes you want to stump your feet if you got it somebody might just want to shout because the word of God is that spirit well how do you know pastor that it is the truth and that it is true because I've never I've never ever never ever seen it fail never seen the word fall short always hit the bullseye right on top of it well how do you know how do you know that it is a limp to your feet and a light to your pathway well I know because some days get awfully dark some days can't see my way but when I go to the word of God it becomes a light at my feet it lights up my pathway how do I know that the word is powerful because I have seen folk with weapons coming after me and their weapons failed because the word said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I know that the word is eternal. It ain't gonna change. Always was. Always is. Always shall be the word of God. Then uh, David says something very profound. He said, he said that the word of God is alive. And when he said that, I thought about, it. well, being alive, that means that it can move. I thought about it. If it's alive, it's got life in it. And then I'm reminded of what John said. He said, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was the beginning with God. And when you go on down into that first chapter, John says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John said, we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And when we saw him, he was full of grace and full of truth. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the word in the flesh. Other holy books, they are words on a page. But our holy book is more than just words on a page. Our holy book, Jesus, was made flesh because he was born of a virgin. Our holy book was made flesh through Jesus because he lived among the people for 30 and three years. Our holy book, Jesus, lived to fulfill the laws of Moses, lived to fulfill the prophets, lived to fulfill the Torah. Our holy book 
Jesus lived to establish the kingdom of heaven right here on earth. Our holy book. Y'all ain't shouting. I don't know what's wrong with you. But our holy book, Jesus, when he finished his work, this chapter was closed. When he, wa when he walked down uh, the streets to Galgotha Hills, when they hung him high and they, they stretched him wide, uh, when they nailed him to that old rugged cross, uh, when he hung his head in the locks of his shoulders, when he died on that cross and just before he died he said it is finished yes. and when they put him in that sealed borrow tomb yes. they were thinking that he was saying that he was finished but that third day morning he woke up he arose with all power uh, not some power but all power on earth and in heaven, in his hand, our Bible, our word of God is Jesus. David refers to the first five books as the law. He refers to it as the statute and the commandments and the judgment. It's the Torah. But, but when we speak of all 66 books in the Bible, we know that Jesus came. To fulfill all of the law, all of the prophet, all of the word of God. Jesus is. He is the word of God. In the flesh, he is the beginning, I in the end. He is the history. He's the poetry. He's the wisdom. He's the prophetic. He's the gospel. He's the letter. He is the conclusion. Did I tell you he's Jewish? Oh, I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help you. I want us to see and understand. We got skin in the game. And we need to be praying that the brothers and sisters in, 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 in our Judeo-Christian faith, uh, that they hold on. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody. No violence, Dr. King says, is acceptable. We need to figure out how to have peace by administering peace. But we also need to know that everybody don't live under the same grace that we live under. Some folks choose to live under the law. And when you put yourself under the law, then the law becomes your justice. I'm trying to connect the dots for you so that you can really see what's going on in this debate, what's going on with this confusion. I ain't here to make you happy. I'm here to teach you something. As an old deacon say, I want to learn you something. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The door of the church stand open. The fundamental foundation of our Judeo-Christian faith is Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus. The doors of the church, they stand open. If you desire Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you desire him to be a part of your life, if you would guide him to be your Bible, your word of God and just come forward and acknowledge with your mouth, confess with your mouth believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he died on the cross, arose from the dead when you do the word says that, that you are saved and salvation is yours it's not that complicated, it's real simple that's why the word says that even a baby, yeah, a baby can make the declaration. The baby decides that they really believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. They say, don't matter whether parents think they ain't ready yet, can I help your parent? It ain't for you to decide. 
Mm. If that baby says that I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, if that baby can put those words together and that baby believes that in his heart, that baby is saved whether you let them come down or not. Salvation is already for us. Baptism is the ritual. It's a formality. But salvation has already happened. Come to Jesus. Just Jesus love. Jesus love. Jesus love. Just now. talking about trust in the word of God. Trust in Come to Jesus. Just now. You may be seated. Acknowledge there's a lot of meat on that bone. Um, but it was, it was in my spirit. I just do what the spirit say do. And when the spirit say move, I move. Still just trying to teach this. I put it out there. A lot of folks scared to deal with this. I don't understand. I, I don't. I don't understand the nature of a Christian coward. That just doesn't register with me, Sister Fels. I don't understand that whole concept of being a Christian coward. I don't. I, I don't understand the idea that that uh, that Jesus, uh, this whole notion that Jesus was passive. <laughs> Jesus wasn't passive. Jesus went in the temple and turned over some tables platted a rope and whooped them folk out of there because they were disrespecting his father's house. That's not passive. <laughs> That's how that ain't passive. Hmm? Amen, somebody. I'm just trying, I, I just want us to see, I want us to see the big picture, Ebenezer. Listen, I don't, I don't want you I don't want you going around just falling for anything. I, as your pastor, as your shepherd, I have a responsibility to help open our eyes so that we can see the grace, the love, the presence, the power, the persistence of God. Because he is real. He is. And his mercy endures forever. He can outlast stubborn. I don't know if anybody got that in the message. I started to stay there for a while, but it was too much material to, to, to stay on there. But let me just say that again. God can outlast stubborn. So whatever stubborn in your life, he can wait you out. He can wait 40 years. He can wait for you to die and get out of his way so that somebody else would do what he assigned you to do. 
He'll do it. He'll do it. But you're not going to stop his blessings. You're not going to stop his will and his way. And, 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 and I, listen, y'all. I, listen, it, it's just time to teach. There is a difference between what God allows and what his will is. God allows us to do a bunch of foolish stuff. But just because he allows it, that does not mean that that is his will. Stop lying on God. You get a flat tire with it, it's just the Lord's will. No, it wasn't. He just allowed you to run over a nail. Could have been saving your life. Because if you had kept going, that something might bad had happened to you. So yeah, that's, when, that's when you say, well, I, all things work together for the good of them who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Uh, y'all, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Let's go home. I feel like teaching. I just feel like teaching today. It's, oh, I love you, Ebenezer. Let's give our babies a hand clap of praise. Uh, they, y'all look good. Y'all look back at them babies back there. Look at them babies. They're back there ushering. They are learning the ministries of the church. Huh? Amen. So I know some of us getting old. We're getting tired. Amen. And we need these young babies to, to stand up. Amen. I understand. Legs tired. You can't stand back there at that door like that, like you used to. These babies are saying, we will. We can and we will. I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Azaria, where you at, baby? Ooh, stand up, baby. That girl sang this. She not sing that song this morning. Bless your heart, girl. Thank you for allowing God to use you and share your gift with us. We're going to put you up more often. Amen. 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 Last year, we saw one of our babies come up, and he didn't even realize what he was doing, but he preached his first sermon. Amen. Amen. Wit- witnessed it with my own eyes. I was shouting. I was shouting. That's I was shouting. Yeah. I think some of us really know what God is able to do. That's Sister John's and that rooster. <laughs> Amen. Y'all, I feel good. I feel good. Good, good. I feel good down in my soul. Every time think about Jesus makes me feel good. (laughs) Come on, do that with me. Stand up. Let's come on. Let's go home. I feel good, good, good. I feel good down in my soul. Every time I think about Jesus makes me feel good. (laughs) You talk about me as much as you please. The more you talk, I'm going to bend my knees. Every time I think about Jesus, makes me feel good. <laughs> oh, I feel good, good, good. I feel good down in my soul. Every time I think about Jesus, makes me feel good. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Present your faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power. Let us sing the threefold amen. God bless you. Love you, Ebenezer.